spotlight tonight, male malaise. The modern male is struggling and talks about why it matters and what to do about it. The, how a lot of men are feeling isolated, lost, and defeated. See why you just don't quit. Because I want to fit in. Greetings, guests. Welcome to the patriarchy, where we explore cinema classics fueled by predictive Hollywood programming and unpack how our favorite characters in cinema got egg all over their faces. I am your commentator, Dom, and tonight we're unpacking Taxi Driver. Did you get my flowers and you didn't get them? I sent some flowers. Yeah, so in the US, that's the data I know best, 15% of men under 30 say they don't have a single close friend now. Okay, okay. Can, can I call you again uh, uh, tomorrow or the next day? So this started as a questionable castings episode, but I actually thought a much more interesting analysis of this film, Taxi Driver, would be how it closely parallels with what we're now seeing as the male loneliness epidemic. And for those who are new to the channel, Questionable Castings is a series that I started back in February that highlights some of the more questionable, aka provocative roles that young girls or minors act out in Hollywood. You can check out this playlist here if you are interested in more of those videos. And this film was suggested as a topic as 12-year-old Jodie Foster plays a New York City prostitute in the film, but we'll touch on that later. So a synopsis of the plot, Taxi Driver is a psychological drama that came out in 1976 directed by Martin Scorsese and stars Robert De Niro and a 12-year-old Jodie Foster. This story follows a 26-year-old former Marine, now New York taxi driver, named Travis Bickle, played by Robert De Niro. So Travis's state of mind back in 1976 as an honorably discharged former Marine somewhat mirrors the characteristics of one that may find themselves as a casualty of the male loneliness epidemic occurring today. So is this idea sometimes of like Lone Ranger, you know, somehow being a man is to be on your own? Right. I think that's the opposite of the truth. I think actually being, being truly masculine is to be there for others. Hmm. It's to be a provider, but not in that narrow sense, but in the kind of broader sense. At the start of the film, we see that he takes a job as a taxi driver for the sole purpose of wanting to work long hours. And not because he's ambitiously saving money for anything, but to simply keep his mind occupied because he suffers from insomnia and loneliness, which is perhaps why he took a job as a taxi driver in the first place, to serve as a band-aid for his chronic loneliness and the act of driving a taxi provides a constant source of human interaction for him. Additionally, the engagement and camaraderie with his fellow taxi drivers also feeds this need. And when he's finished with his shift, because he's lacking human connection, we see that he is a regular patron of an adult movie theater to watch people intimately connect on screen. So Travis isn't a total goober. He does, after all, have the courage to engage in conversation and ask his quote unquote crush, Betsy, out on a date, whom I'd like to know that he's crushing on her from afar. His first interaction with her is when he approaches her to ask her on a date. So this behavior displays what a lot of not just men, but people do in general, which is to idolize someone without really knowing who they are. He sort of pedestalizes Betsy as this pure and ethereal woman thinking that he's got her all figured out without ever even having had a conversation with her. And we'll see later that he knocks her off of that pedestal when she doesn't acquiesce to his needs. So back to the story. Initially, we see Travis stalking Betsy outside of her workplace, but he does make the bold move and decides to engage and very persuasively gets Betsy to have coffee with him. And from this first quasi first date, the pair do hit it off as they are both intrigued by each other. Travis intrigued by her beauty and mystery and Betsy intrigued by him because he's such a contradiction. As she puts it, referencing lyrics from a song called Pilgrim by Chris Christopherson. And she quotes the song, he's a prophet, he's a pusher, partly truth, partly fiction, a walking contradiction. 
And as a side note, Betsy is quite intuitive. She doesn't know this yet, but Travis is in fact a walking contradiction. After all, he does love, I mean love watching dirty movies, while also at the same time being utterly disgusted and kind of turning his nose up at all of the ladies of the night that he sees while he's driving his taxi. So this interaction naturally prompts another date but this is where we the audience truly begin to understand the gravity of Travis's disconnection from the world or at least his disconnection from the opposite sex. Travis suggests that they go to the movies which sounds innocent enough right but it's not just any movie it's one of those special kind of adult films that he enjoys frequenting on a nightly basis. This obviously makes Betsy uncomfortable. She's hesitant to go in the theater, but he lightly pushes her to have an open mind, kind of gaslighting her saying that he sees couples in the theater all the time. And so when she's in the theater watching these intimate scenes with a man that she barely even knows, of course she's uncomfortable and she gets up and walks out the theater because like, what the hell? I don't like these movies. Well, I mean, I... You know, I didn't know that you'd, you'd feel that way about this movie. I'm taking you to a place own. like this is about as exciting to me as saying that's And this is a good lesson from Betsy on how we as women should conduct ourselves on dates. If you're put in an uncomfortable situation, exit stage left immediately. You don't need to explain yourself. You don't need to go back and forth with negotiations on your comfortability. Just leave. And Travis is so far gone that he's actually confused as to why she doesn't want to speak to him anymore. And after many attempts to reconnect with flowers and phone calls, Betsy really stood her ground. He angrily writes Betsy off as being quote unquote just like the rest of them for strongly enforcing her boundaries. Look, well, come hell. on! You're in a hell. And you're gonna die in a hell like the rest come of them. Come on now, there's a cop across the street. You're like the rest of them. And to quote the laws of human nature, his reaction, meaning Travis's, is a reflection of his mind, not his reality. His social skills and emotional intelligence are clearly lacking, and instead of being a tiny bit introspective about the situation, he now cloaks this sweeping generalization that he has about women and ex-workers that he sees every night onto the only woman that he's garnered interest in which is something that we see happening a lot nowadays right from both genders these over generalizations of the opposite sex so after this rejection and unstable in my opinion travis purchases a bunch of firearms for the intent of acting out this vigilante fantasy of shooting criminals and pimps and tricks and saving prostitutes the character of travis bickle seems to have an extreme hatred for people specifically the people of new york and very ironically a hatred for people that in his eyes are quote-unquote impure this theme of hatred for impurity and overall contempt for humanity shows up a lot very well displayed in his spree towards the end of the film and this tirade sort of centers around iris the 12 year old prostitute played by jodie foster men need purpose and travis's purpose came to be to save that 12 year old girl who he still saw as innocent and wants to and successfully does save her from a life of dereliction. So now is the perfect time to move on to 12-year-old Jodie Foster's role in the film. You looking for some action? Yeah. Which is actually not a major part in the movie. I believe she shows up in like the last 40 minutes. But yes, she's a New York City prostitute based on a real life girl of the same age who actually does make a cameo in the film. But this questionable casting is actually a casting that I take no issue with. Mainly because Jodie Foster did an interview discussing all of the measures that were taken to ensure her psychological safety while acting out this role. Here's a clip of that interview where she talks a bit about her role in the film. And then he called my mother up and said, you know, I have this role for a prostitute in New York. And my mother thought she, he was crazy. So she brought me in my uniform, my school uniform. And uh, he said, well, you know, I think she's perfect. And my mom thought he was insane. The Board of Education got a hold of the script for Taxi Driver. 
and uh, they weren't sure whether they would allow me to play it because I was a minor, I was underage, and they wanted to know that making the film wouldn't damage my morals. So there were a variety of things that I had to do in order to be allowed to do the film. I had to meet with a psychiatrist to make a decision whether I was sane or not and whether I could handle it. And there were some things that they had to change. If there were any provocative scenes that um, were too suggestive sexually, uh, the production agreed that they would get a stand-in to be in those scenes. So we all said, well, my sister's the same size. Why don't you have her come? She's, you know, eight years older than I am. So there's my sister Connie, uh, all decked up in kind of prostitute wear. Um, she did, uh, you know, some of the scenes behind the shoulder when there's a question of, you know, whether I'm unzipping his pants or something. That's my sister Connie. So I don't think that it's okay for children to be sexualized in films. And if the casting director has an opportunity to cast someone a bit older who still looks the age of the character, there are people out there with baby faces, then that's the person who should be cast, in my opinion. And Jody does speak about being uncomfortable in the outfits that she had to wear as they were a bit more revealing than she was used to. I remember the wardrobe fittings very well for a taxi driver. Ruth Morley was the costume designer, brilliant costume designer who's died since, but uh, I remember being just completely embarrassed. They made me wear these clothes that I would never wear, you know, hot pants. And I was the kind of girl who, like, I wouldn't wear anklet socks. I would only wear knee socks because I didn't like, like, any part of my leg showing. I mean, I really had clothes phobias. And here I was in platform heels with a ton of makeup on and halter tops and uh, I was mortified. I was completely embarrassed by it. And I, I remember going with my mom and going shopping with Ruth and I remember at one point, you know, starting to cry. And going, you know, I can't believe I have to wear this awful clothes. But that really was the extent of it. I appreciate how production used her older sister as a stand-in for scenes that were just too inappropriate for someone her age to act out. So that's all I have on the movie Taxi Driver. If you haven't seen it, it's actually a really great film, although it's a bit gruesome at the end. But what are your thoughts on the character of Travis Bickle or on the casting of Jodie Foster in the film? I'd love to hear any additional comments you may have so please drop them in the comments below and as always thank you for your continued support of this channel subscribe if you haven't already like and share with your friends as well signing off now your friend dom in the past the ways in which men connected relationally those institutions the role for men was kind of prescribed so we've taken that away but i think absent those those props if you like <laughs> i think a lot of men are really struggling to mm. figure out what kind of relationship should I be in? In a way, those questions were answered for us mm -hmm. under the previous regime of patriarchy. But what worries me is like we haven't replaced it with AIDS.